Ascension Cathedral in Oakland, California. And uh, we are continuing our uh, discussions on a pilgrimage to Pascha. And we are just entering into Holy Week, Holy Week, the first week of Great Lent in the Orthodox Church. We'll begin uh, with, a, with a prayer. We'll say the Lenten prayer of Saint Ephraim the Syrian. O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, meddling, lust of power, and idle talk, but give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to your servant. Yea, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own sins and not judge my brother. For you are holy now and forever into the ages of ages. Amen. We will talk about the Lenten prayer of Saint Ephraim in, in the future. Um, but today, we're going to do something that I wasn't planning on doing, but it's I think it's very, very important. We're going to actually talk about what we're doing this week, what happened yesterday and today. Um, I'm trying to stay a week ahead, and we'll, we'll come to that as we reach the uh, towards the end uh, of, of, our, of our discussion today. But today, I really want to focus in on um, the beginning of Great Lent, and the importance of what is transpiring here uh, since yesterday. As I've been telling you over the past few weeks, that the uh, the Sundays kind of set the tone for what we're trying to, uh, uh, to accomplish here as Orthodox Christians. And yesterday was a very, very important Sunday. And I didn't talk about it last week. I talked about some other things. But on the, the Sunday before Great Lent begins, the day before it begins, in addition to all the other things that uh, are um, that are going on, uh, we commemorate an event that goes back to our uh, most primordial history as Christians, and that is the the uh, the event of the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden from paradise and i want to talk about that in a sense as we begin here today because it's so important it's it sets again like all these other things that we've talked about over the past few weeks sets the stage for who we are how we are to uh if you will benefit from this period of time and how we can better experience um, this this uh, this sacred time of the year. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the pre-sanctified liturgy. We're going to talk a little bit about um, Great Compline, and then we'll talk uh, again about what next Sunday brings us. So all these things, there's so much going on during Great Lent, so many different things, and uh, it is important that we're aware of these things so that we can benefit from them. So the church lays out this kind of like this plan for us and uh, um, helps us uh, walk this walk, if you will. So we have, as of last night around sunset, we have entered into Great Lent. It is also um, uh, known yesterday as Forgiveness Sunday. It is the tradition in many parishes to have Vespers and for people to come to the Vespers and ask forgiveness of each other. But before that, at the Divine Liturgy, we commemorated the, uh, the event of Adam and Eve's expulsion of, uh, 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 of them from paradise. So between the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise and this uh, forgiveness of Sunday, it becomes a time of reorienting to ourselves, if you will. We are looking about at who we are, this condition we're in, and how do we do we grow from this? Starting today, we are in the forty-day period of Great Lent, and if you take forty and compare it to a year, 365, uh, we have about 10% of the year. St. Dorotheus of Gaza calls Great Lent a tithe of time. 40 days is 10% of our year. And with this tithe of time, we are trying to intensify our 
spiritual efforts. And as we learned from uh, the previous uh, Sunday, um, to spend more time in prayer, to practice the fast as we are able, and to help others, almsgiving, charity. Yesterday, celebrated, commemorated, better word, commemorated, the event of Adam and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden, from paradise. Now, why is that important? Well, in order to know who we are and where we're going, we, under, we have to understand who we were, if you will. And we have to understand the Orthodox Church is the Church's understanding of, of, of God's creation. I do not want to get into it. I never get into a debate over uh, uh, science and, and religion. Um, this is an understanding of who we are in the total sense of being a human being. And in that sense, the uh, the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise is very, very important. Because in the end, uh, our goal is to re-enter into paradise with with uh, with and to live with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, if we go back to the beginning, Adam and Eve was created, were created by God. They were created to live forever. So they had a beginning, but they weren't going to have an end. And the goal was for us to live with God in his presence forever and ever and ever. That's paradise. Okay? However, as we all know the story, um, they were given a commandment not to eat of the tree of uh knowledge of good and evil they ate of that tree and with that with that disobedience sin sin enters into uh the very nature the being of adam and eve so now we have a problem if adam and eve now live forever the state that they have now entered into a state where they use their free will the free will that god had given them to choose and they choose wrongly now sin has entered into them and that too will live forever and this is a horrific thing first of all sin is a very destructive worm if you will it bores into us and it it uh it leads us and guides us to do things that are, are against our better nature and it's difficult it's difficult to fight against especially on our own so we have that. Sin cannot exist in God's presence. There will be uh, an uneasiness. There will be a, a pain for an, a sinful person to stand before God. So we've got that. Sin forces us away from God. And sin does not allow us to live with God. And this is a very, very wretched state to be in. So the cure for this situation, first of all, is for Adam and Eve to be expelled from the Garden of Eden. Sinful humans cannot live with perfect God. The glory of God will just be overwhelming. But the other problem is this, is Adam and Eve were, are now created to live forever, which means sin would live forever, as I said. So now there has to be a cure, and the cure is rather difficult to, to accept. The cure for sin is death. So Adam and Eve are expelled from the Garden of Eden, they are immortal, mortal, they're going to die. They are afflicted with the results of the fall from grace. So now humanity has to endure corruption, 
which is growing old, being susceptible to illnesses, suffering from all sorts of uh, horrible physical situations. We are also now susceptible to sin, and without God, we become very, very susceptible to sin. And we have to go through death. So we have all that going on. We are not responsible for the sin of Adam and Eve. But we, we, we do receive, in our nature, the results of their sin. So Adam and Eve could only reproduce what they had become. They could not reproduce and uh, uh, give birth to immortal, immortal beings that had not been infected with sin. So we have to know what all this means so that we can understand uh, what we're trying to accomplish as human beings. Again, going back to the beginning of the creation of humanity, we are the crown of God's creation. And if you go back to Genesis, uh, the Logos, the Word of God, speaks everything into existence. Christ, Jesus Christ. Uh, the second person of the Trinity, the Logos of God, is the creative power of God. And he speaks everything into existence. Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be moon and stars, there were moon and stars. Let there be earth and heaven, sun, and there were. But when it came to the creation of mankind, of humanity, we are told that God formed to us from the dust of the earth with his own two hands. And when he created us, he gave us certain graces, certain attributes that are godly and godlike. The ability, the ability to reason, the ability to love, the ability to have knowledge, to know. So we were created special by God, and we were created to live forever. This relationship is destroyed when Adam and Eve, using their God-given free will, disobeyed God. We read about this in chapter 3. And again, the response was the exile and death. So we were in paradise. We were created to live forever, but deceived and misusing the free will that God has given us. Our forebears are exiled from paradise and separated from God. And as it says in Genesis 3.24, they are kept from re-entering paradise by the, cherub, by the cherubim and the flaming sword, an angel of God, the flaming sword. And this is as much to protect Adam and Eve from the glory of God as it is to keep them from the tree of, uh, of life. Because we cannot stand before God as we are told no, when Moses, no one can see God and, 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 and continue to live. There's a beautiful tradition that I learned from one of the monasteries. Uh, I, the abbot at the Holy Archangels Monastery in Texas told me this story that um, there is a tradition at Vespers and especially at the pre-sanctified liturgy to take a lit candle on a stand and place it before the royal doors. The doors are closed uh, at the chanting of the psalm, uh, Lord, I have cried to you, hear me. Hear me, O Lord. Kiria Kekraksa. It's the psalm that is chanted at every Vesper service. And that lit candle standing before the royal doors symbolizes Adam and Eve standing outside the entrance to the Garden of Eden, lamenting the loss of the Garden. We too are called to cry out to God, Hear me, O Lord. Give heed to the voice of my supplication. We should desire to be with God, and great Lent is the perfect time to act on this desire, to cultivate this spot, desire, and to know and be with God. The entire Old Testament describes the efforts of man and the action of God to help restore the relationship between God and man, the law of Moses, 
the rules, the regulations, the Torah, the commandments are reco uh, as recorded in the, in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. We have the judges, the kings, the historical, historical books. We have the writings like Psalms and Proverbs. And then, of course, we have the prophets. But in their totality, they could not relieve mankind's suffering. There was something that we just couldn't, we couldn't do on our own. But he who was proclaimed by the Old Testament, by the Pentateuch, by the Torah, by the writings, by the historical books, and by the prophets, he could and he does. The Messiah, the anointed one of God, Christ, would bring salvation to all the people of the world. So with Christ coming into the world, we have the means to return to God. So now we have, if you will, the cure for the brokenness of Adam and Eve. Our Lord's efforts from his birth, his preaching, his teaching, his miracles, his passion, his crucifixion on the cross, his death and resurrection. With all that, Christ reopens the road back to God and reopens the path back to paradise. So, in a sense, the gates of paradise have been reopened. A bridge has been built between us and God. And we no longer need to be separated from God. We don't need to be out there on our own, struggling. We follow the commandments. We follow the teachings of the church. If we stay true to the teachings of the Old Testament, because they still are part of who we are and who we are supposed to be, the, the, the Torah and, and all the writings of the Old Testament still are to impact us. We can utilize these things to help us. But there's something special that has happened now with Christ coming into the world. There has been a healing, if you will. And that's where we are right now. Most of us that are participating in this, uh, in this program have been baptized and confirmed into the faith. And the road that God has for us has been laid out. Our pilgrimage, our journey is before us. It began 2,000 years ago, if you will. The, uh, the pilgrimage began 2,000 years ago with all that Christ has done, and it continues through today. With our Lord's passion and resurrection, sin and evil are overthrown. They have no power over us. And there's a whole thing about that as well, but they need not have power over us. We may slip and fall. We may make mistakes, but we don't have to live in sin and brokenness all our lives. We may, like I said, we may make mistakes, but they don't have to rule our lives. We are given the grace to become the children of God. And through this wonderful gift of baptism, we are changed. We are transfigured. We have become different ontologically. I mean, the way we exist now, we can exist knowing God. God can work in our lives. But it's not enough to be baptized. Once that transfiguration takes place, we have to do something with it. It's like been, you've been given the keys to a brand new car, and the car is sitting out there, and you're just looking at it from the street, you know, just looking at the car. You have to get in. You have to know how to drive it. You have to start it up, and you have to proceed to drive. Same thing happens with our spiritualized once we're baptized we have to put it into action this is what we call the process of salvation we were saved when christ died upon the cross and now as we live our lives as we pursue a relationship with christ as we walk the walk with christ we are in the process of salvation, and we look forward to the time when he comes back, when we yet will be totally saved, when, when he comes back at his second coming. So we need to practice and live our faith. 
we need to participate in the mysteries of the church, benefit from, from regular Holy Communion, to going to confession, to having an active prayer life, to reading the scriptures, to be loving, to be merciful, forgiving, to become a righteous person. And again, it is our hope that as we depart this life, that we will return to God. One of my favorite sayings, I've used it in sermons many, many times, is um, an Apache saying that if we do not turn around now, we may get to where we're going. And I know I've probably overused this statement, uh, but it's it's a great it's a great line. We have to stop and assess where are we headed, and if we're headed down the wrong path. It's time to stop and turn around. Great Lent is that opportunity to do that, to understand who we are, to understand that we are human beings, that God has come to the world to redeem, to save, to offer a new path, to understand that um, we have this grace given to us by God to return to him. And if we take this 10% of the year and utilize it to intensify our relationship with God, to uh, reestablish some of the things that we're supposed to be doing, to get into good habits again, then we will really benefit from who we are as human beings. Um, Great Lent is a little bit like... Uh, I don't know if you want to call it spring training. Baseball started spring training is happening right now. And even professional baseball players are going through basic drills, learning how to do certain things. The finest um, um, classical musicians practice, 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 doing drills that we may think are simple and silly, but for them, it helps them to become better musicians. Why not do the same thing with, with our with our spiritual lives? That's what these 40 days, this, this tide of the year is, is to understand who we were, who we are, and where we want to be. And uh, hopefully through uh, our efforts in Great Lent, we will come out of this a little bit stronger, a little bit wiser, a little more connected to God. And then we build upon that. And we continue through a year and, and we get the benefit of uh, moving up a step in our relationship with God. So uh, that's the first thing I want to talk to you about. The second thing I want to talk to you about, and uh, for those of you that are on East Coast time, uh, it may be uh, a little late for you unless you're already there, is to participate in some of the services that Bright Lent has to offer. And one of the services that um, is done on Monday evenings, and in some parishes and, and here in Oakland, we will do it Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. And then every Monday during Great Lent is the ser service of Great Compline, to Mega Apodigno. It, it, it's a very simple service, and what it means, it says, uh, after dinner, you would do this service. Apo vipno, after the meal. The great compline. So it's it's uh, a service that takes place at the towards the end of evening or middle of the evening. Uh, if you were in a monastery, you wouldn't even go into the main church. You would be in the north ex, and the and the 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 compline is done there. But the the great compline has many different parts to it one of the uh, uh a lot of psalms are read uh of course there are different uh uh hymns that are sung but one of uh the ones that we're going to talk about tonight is this hymn and this will be very very brief is um uh, is a refrain that we hear uh throughout the uh, uh, part early part of the service which is for God is with us. For God is with us. God is with us here at your nations. For God is with us. It proclaims a deep truth 
and communicates an awesome message that God is present in this world. God is present in our church. God is present in our lives and God is present in us. Difficult thing for us sometimes is to recognize that. We see everything that's going on around us, the struggles that we have within us. And again, as we said earlier, we need to stop for a moment, reassess, and remember that God is with us. He may not be with you, or he may not answer you the way you want him to answer. But God answers us in the way that he feels he needs to answer us. We are told in the uh, uh, Old Testament that Moses encounters God at the burning bush. And God tells Moses, I have a mission for you. Uh, I want you to go back and to free my people from bondage under Pharaoh and Egypt. And Moses says, well, which God are you? Which God are you? And to that, God says, oh, and I am that I am. I mean, it means I'm the existing God. But there's another interesting translation. I think it comes uh, from a Hebrew scholar that says, I am present as I choose to be present. I am with you when I choose to be with you, as I choose to be with you. God is with us. And his presence may not be exactly what you think it should be, but it's exactly what God knows it needs to be. But know that he is with you. You're not alone. And sometimes we have to endure things. But again, even in that endurance, God is with us and he's helping us. So uh, that is early on in the service of uh of the uh, of the uh, great compline. The other th the other service that's going on this week will be the service that we call the, the liturgy of the pre sanctified gifts. So, what is this? The liturgy of the pre sanctified gifts. Yesterday, uh, when we celebrated the divine liturgy in Oakland. We, and as you probably know, uh, we have uh, prepared a host, a cube of bread that has yeast in it. And that cube that sits on a plate called the paten becomes the body of Christ. And the wine that's in the chalice becomes the blood of Christ. And it's from those two elements that we give you communion on the spoon. Some of the bread, now the body of Christ, and some of the wine that is now the blood of Christ. The church does not get into the uh, uh, philosophical uh, arguments of what is what or how it ha how it happens or or the, the uh, scientific or even chemical formulation. We simply say in the form of bread and wine, you're receiving the body and blood of Christ. It is the body and blood of Christ. That's it. Don't go in, we don't go any further. But yesterday we did something unique uh, for this period of the year is that we also had two other hosts, lambs, prepared. So there was the cube that we used to give communion to the faithful yesterday, and there were two others that are now sitting on the altar table in uh, our church in Oakland at the Ascension Cathedral, perhaps in your church, I'm sure in your church, wherever you are, there's at least one, maybe two, uh, already consecrated hosts that are on the altar that will be used on Wednesday and perhaps on Friday. And the other thing we do is we take the uh, uh, the host, the cube of, of, of leavened bread that is now the body of Christ, and some priests dip it into the chalice. Other priests will take the spoon and tincture it for the blood of Christ onto the host, and then that'll be put on a on a paten or a container on the altar table. And come Wednesday night, uh, we will then uh, have a service, the service of the pre-sanctified liturgy, and we will offer communion. And 
it's interesting that we do this. And why do we do this? Um, I haven't mentioned this before. I should have mentioned it uh, pre previously. There is a great book by uh, Father Alexander Schmem and uh, Great Lent called The Journey to Pascha. And uh, it was written, gosh, how many years ago? Probably in, I'm just going to look here, uh, 30, 40 years ago. Um, anyway, he has a beautiful breakdown of pre-Latin period, Latin period, but he also has a chapter alone on the pre-sanctified liturgy, and he goes into quite detail explaining what's going on here. And I do want to take a couple of little things from him. I don't want to get into the detail that he has. You can read it for yourself, but there's some interesting points here. Once Great Lent has begun today, we do not celebrate divine liturgies Monday through Friday, except if the Feast of the Annunciation falls during Great Lent. A week from today, March 25th, is the feast day of the Annunciation. So there will be a divine liturgy for that celebration in your church or in most churches. But typically, Monday through Friday, we do not celebrate divine liturgy. But at the same time, the church doesn't want us to be without the spiritual nourishment of Holy Communion. So we have a we have the priest sanctified liturgy where um, that priest sanctified already prepared communion kept on the altar is offered in the context of a service, and we'll talk to that about in a minute. One of the issues during this period is that this is a period of fasting. And Father Schmemann talks about the Eucharist being incompatible with fasting. It is almost the opposite of fasting, it is feasting. But the church knows that we need to be not only celebrating the death and re the resurrection of Christ by receiving Holy Communion, we also need to be nurtured by it. So the church has come up with a way of, of doing this. Now, the other thing he points out here is that we are in a period of fasting, and there are two types of fasts in the church. There's total abstinence, where you don't eat anything. Typically, this is the, the way we prepare ourselves to receive Holy Communion, uh, from the time we fall asleep until we receive Holy Communion in the morning, we do not eat anything. We do not drink anything. For those of you that are able, if you're on medications and there are exceptions, you know, for people that are ill, exceptions, of course, are there. But for, for most people, we do not eat before we receive, uh, we receive Holy Communion. So that's totally abstinence, total abstinence. And there's another thing that uh, Father Alexander calls the ascetic fast. And this is an abstinence from certain foods. During this period of, of, of Great Lent, uh, for those of you that are trying to follow the, the, the regular fast of the church, you, you're not eating meat, you're not eating poultry, you're not eating dairy, you're not eating eggs, you're not using olive oil, and then there's the whole discussion as to whether you should be eating uh, uh, any type of oil whatsoever, uh, I'm not going to get into that right now, but there is a strict tradition of no olive oil except on Saturdays and Sundays. And a relaxation of the fast on Saturdays and Sundays is eating olive oil and having wine, but no no wine either. And there's also discussions, you know, is beer considered that or strong alcohol? You know, basically it's all the same. It's all the same. So we have the ascetical fast. Wednesdays and Fridays, are days of total abstinence, abstinence in the church, in the strict tradition of the church. Uh, that's kind of been lost, and Father uh, Schmemann talks about that, that we have not uh, really understood the, the 
the, the back and forth, the process uh, of fasting that we have in the church and why we fast. But Wednesdays and Fridays uh, were, were days of total fast. In the monasteries, uh, the traditional Mount office that I'm aware of is that uh, today, tomorrow, and until the pre-sanctified liturgy, they do not eat at all, almost three days. And then during the week of Lent, Wednesdays and Fridays, they do not eat. So they will not, they break the fast with communion. And um, as Wednesdays and Fridays were a full, a set, a full total fast, um, the offering of Holy Communion began to happen in the evenings rather than the mornings. But what's also interesting, and I learned this from, from my uh, First Corinthians Bible study, is that in the early church, the uh, Eucharist, uh, the uh, agape meal, and the Eucharist was given in the evenings. It was later transform, trans, uh, uh, transferred to the mornings. But this was a, a practice of the church that you would not eat all day and you would break the fast by receiving communion on Wednesday and Friday, Friday evening. Um, the fast, whether it's the total abstinence or the ascetic uh, or the ascetical fast, is there to help us deal with the tyranny of the flesh, that we don't allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by the flesh. So we will, on Wednesday evening, celebrate the divine liturgy or the pre-sanctified gifts. And what is it? Well, basically, it is a service that allows us to give Holy Communion. But we do not do the Divine Liturgy because the Divine Liturgy already has consecrated the, the bread and wine that will be distributed on Wednesday and Friday. So what it is, it's a Vesper service with uh, the reading of certain um, psalms. There will be uh, three sets of psalms, read, three sets of five psalms that will be read. And during those reading of the psalms, the priest, well, let me go back. On Sunday, as I said, the, the gifts are placed on in a container or a paten and um, uh, are, are on the altar table. Some traditions have it at the table of preparation. Uh, most churches now, from what I'm aware of, believe the, uh, the consecrated uh, gifts on the holy altar. Anyway, the service begins. There's the reading of the psalm. And then the doors to the entrance of the altar are closed. And now the priest begins to prepare the gifts. And what is what is happening here? Well, the gifts are going to be transferred from the container onto the paten. Um, and they will be very, very carefully and very, very piously um, removed from the one paten onto the paten that will be used for the divine liturgy or the container onto the paten. Uh, the, the, the gifts will be covered like we do on, a, on the great entrance. They will be sensed, and then they will be taken to the side altar, and then wine and water will be placed into the chalice. And as we continue um, the, uh, the service, uh, the gifts are are left there until they will be transferred. There will be readings tonight from Isaiah, Genesis, and Proverbs, or from Genesis and Proverbs, the reading of Isaiah earlier today. And then at a certain point in time, after the altar is being sensed with the priest holding uh, a candle and sensing the altar, uh, chanting, uh, uh, let my prayer arise as incense before you. Af after that, we now kind of shift into what would be the last portion of the divine liturgy. And there will be a great entrance with the consecrated gifts, and they will be placed on the altar. 
pre-communion prayers will be said, and then the uh, the clergy will receive communion, and then communion will be distributed, and then the liturgy comes to a fairly quick end. But the purpose of this is to give you an opportunity to receive communion at least on Wednesday, and in Oakland, we do it on Friday as well. And I will tell you that we do the pre-sanctified liturgy on Friday in the morning. There's a whole another tradition about that as well, uh, even though it's a vesperal service. But uh, we do try to offer our congregation the opportunity to receive communion on uh, Wednesday, Friday, and again on Sunday. In some churches, they will do liturgy every Saturday as well, because that's a day that you're allowed to do the divine liturgy. So that's the uh, pre-sanctified liturgy. And that's, again, part of it. It's, it's a Lenten service, and it's a very big part of, of who we, we are. As, as Orthodox Christians. So we've got that going on as well. So uh, the last thing that we're going to talk about tonight is what we're celebrating on Sunday, this coming Sunday, a week, uh, six days. And it is the first Sunday of Great Lent. It is called the Sunday of Orthodoxy, or Orthodoxy, however you like to pronounce the word. And it is the uh, beginning of the second week of Lent. So we've started the first week of Lent. And we come to Sunday, the first Sunday in Lent. And then that evening we begin the second week of Great Lent. Now there's another little issue. Uh, after church on, on Sunday, uh, on the Sunday of ortho orthopathy, uh, we have the procession of the icons. We have uh, all these other things that take place. And then in some communities, in some cities, that service is re redone again Sunday evening, which is incorrect. We should be, if we're going to do these, uh, the, the Vespers for the, uh, for the Sunday of Orthodoxy, that should, that's supposed to happen on Saturday night. But well, we found over the course of time in different cities that it's easier for all the communities to gather on Sunday evening. So we do that on Sunday night. The uh, celebration of, uh, of the Sunday of Orthodoxy is by our standards, uh, not so old, not so old, about... It goes back to about the 7th, 8th, ninth century. And um, the historical background of this very, very simply is that uh, the church battled for almost 200 years, maybe it was 176, almost 200 years, whether it was okay to have icons in the church or not. It was finally decided at the Seventh Ecumenical Council. It was not fully affirmed to for another few years afterwards to, to allow icons in the church. And this issue became a very, very important discussion on who is Jesus Christ. And if you look at almost every ecumenical council, all seven of them, they almost exclusively, when it came down to dogma, dealt with who is Jesus Christ. And it's, it's a very, very important balance that the church has kept, that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. If he were not God, he could not have saved us. If he were not, a, if he were not God, he could, if he were not man, could not have died. Um, that was one little short statement about this. But it's important to, to understand that we are celebrating uh, not only the use of icons and, and the uh, uh, ability to... Uh, use them in very different ways, uh, all important. But it's also important that we know that this was done to maintain the truth of our faith. And we're going to spend a few minutes talking about that now. The hymns of the um, of the of of that of those services uh, from Vespers on Saturday evening, and from the matins on 
Sunday morning, all reflect and emphasize the truth and reality of Christ's incarnation. One of the one of the early struggles in the church. We're talking about when St. Paul was out preaching and the and and Peter was out preaching. There were people here or there that uh could not accept that a God, the God, would become a human being. These were people that were heavily influenced by what was called Gnosticism, Platonic thought, uh, Greek mystery religions, whatever you want to call it. They were influenced by these different things, but they all have one thing in common in that there's no way in their mind, in their hearts, that a God could become a human being. They might appear as a human being, but they would not become a human being to become, especially in uh, Gnosticism and Platonic thought, uh, a souls were punished by being placed into a body. They believed in the pre-existence of the souls, that there were all these little souls up in, in the, in, in, in the uh, uh, ideal world, in the ethereal realm, in the heavens, or whatever you want to call it, and that the gods punished these souls by putting them into bodies, and that the the souls would all they wanted to do was was escape. Well, the birth of Christ, the incarnation of Christ, set that on its ear, and these people who wanted to quote unquote believe in a, in Jesus and some of the things he stood for could not accept that, so they would fight against that. I think this spirit, if you will, uh, kind of underlined. Uh, part of the opposition to icons in addition the uh, uh the understanding of uh the old testament thou shalt not have any graven images before me before you uh but these are not graven images so we're not worshiping the icons a graven image was okay you had a carving of a lion and the lion the carving the statue was the god that that you worship that piece of of whatever it was metal or uh or pottery the icon has a different sense the icon is a a means for us to better experience god to have almost like this little uh vision of 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 god's grace but it's not the wood and the paint that we worship and there were, from what I was told, from what I learned, there were abuses that people did do that with the icon. Some people, we are told, even scraped some of the elements off the icon, the paint, uh, and and the and the uh, and the, and the uh, gold leaf, and mixed it in with communion. I've I've heard of things like that, but that's not the rule. That's not what was what was really being being celebrated the icon is a means of god's grace just like um this world is a means of god's grace just like uh, the sacraments are means of god's grace the icons are ways that we can in a sense have the presence of god in our homes in our churches um, and when people venerate an icon they're not worshiping it of course we all know this but we are giving honor to what the icon represents and in fact one of the hymns even says that so i want to spend the next few minutes just talking about this about the uh, uh some of the hymns of the church talking about the the icons and uh one of the hymns uh, i think this is from uh, saturday evening vespers sings the following we who have advanced from impiety to true religion, impiety meaning the anti uh, against icons, the iconoclasts, to true religion, the iconodules, Luli, the servants of, of the icons, have been illumined with the light of knowledge. Let us clap our hands, as the psalmist says, offering praise to God with gratitude. And let us venerate the sacred images of Christ and the all pure virgin and all the saints depicted on walls and panels and sacred vessels with honor befitting them, rejecting the impious religion of the heretics. For as Basil said, the honor that is shown to the image passes to the prototype. 
We entreat you, O Christ our God, at the intercessions of our all pure mother and of all the saints, that we may be granted your great mercy. So again, this understanding uh, that I mentioned earlier that the the honor given to the icon passes on to what the icon represents. When I was uh, a very young priest in in in, in, in Chattanooga, I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee at the time, and it was the time of Gulf War One. Um, this was we're talking about the, in the early mid eighties. And um, there was a woman who, whose husband, who had retired from the military after, I don't know, 10, 12 years, he was an officer, but he had not resigned his commission. And uh, what I learned then is that uh, if you were an officer in the U.S. Armed Forces, in order for you, uh, if you are not, if you not, if you had not resigned your commission, you had uh, you were on what was called involuntary reserve, which meant the armed forces could call you back. And this woman's husband and a lot of other people were called back onto active duty because of this clause. So they showed her on a news program, a television, and she had a photo of her husband and she kisses the picture of her husband. Uh, it wasn't because she loved the chemicals that made the photo. She loved her husband. And by kissing that picture, she was kissing, expressing her love for her husband. We kiss the things that we love. So this is the same thing with the icons. We're not kissing the wood, the paint, the gold leaf. We are honoring that which is depicted as St. Basil says here. A couple of the other hymns go on to say, depicting your divine form and icons of Christ, we openly proclaim your divinity is becoming flesh. Your ineffable miracles, your, invo your voluntary crucifixion. So we are proclaiming your birth in the flesh, your miracles, and your voluntary crucifixion. So the devils are driven out in fear, and the heretics and their fellow workers lament in shame and sorrow. So very, very negative against the iconoclast. Once more, the master's countenance is depicted, venerated, and honored with faith. Once more, the church regains her boldness of approach to God, reverently glorifying our Savior. Beautiful stuff. The last one, uh, and this little, these little, uh, this group of ones, the honor and veneration we show to the icon we ascribe to the prototype it represents. Following the teachings of the saints inspired by God, with faith we cry out aloud to Christ, all works of the Lord, bless you, the Lord. St. Maximus, the confessor, one of the great theologians, one of the great teachers of the Orthodox Church, says the following, and it kind of underlines who Christ is. And it's important that we understand this as Orthodox faithful. He's talking about who Christ is. And because of this, he writes, God became perfect man, taking on everything that belongs to human nature except sin. According to Hebrews 4.15. And indeed, sin is not part of human nature. So right here, he gives us a huge understanding now of to who God is and who we are. First of all, God becomes perfect man, not the fallen like we are, but perfect man. And he takes on everything that is human and human nature except sin. God assumes all our nature because of what is not assumed is not saved. That's Gregory, uh, the theologian. In other words, he become, everything that he becomes, all of humanity uh, is redeemed by God because he takes it on. And sin is not part of human nature. That's now how God created us to be, as we talked about at the very, very beginning here. Our human nature was we were not created to sin and we were not created to die. That's why sin works its way on us and, and, and it's a negative force within us whether we realize it or not, and why we fight against death. 
because it's not natural. We were not created to die. So he goes on to say, in this way, by enticing the insatiable serpent with the bait of flesh, he provoked him to open his mouth and swallow it. Okay, the bait is Christ. And now uh, the serpent, the devil, swallows the divinity. This flesh proved poison to him, destroying him utterly by the power of his divinity within when Christ dies and death accepts him. It poisons death, trampling down death by death. We will be singing about that in about six weeks. But to human nature, but to us, to our human nature, this same power of divinity proved remedy restoring it to its original grace by the same power of the divinity within. Christ becoming one of us introduces the antidote to sin and death. It introduces us to have to be able to overcome sin. We don't need to be enslaved by sin. We, know, we don't need to live by sin. We may fall, but we don't have to live under its uh, uh, horrible, uh, horrible, uh, uh, way of life and he, he grants us life to have it eternally for just as the devil poured out his venom venom of sin on the tree of knowledge and corrupted human nature once it tasted it so when he wished to devour the flesh of the master he himself was destroyed by the power of the divinity within it so the coming of Christ and all that he has done is to restore to us who we are meant to be. And Great Lent is a beautiful time for us to make that journey, to make this pilgrimage, to understand these things that are going on, for us to better experience the love and, and the presence of Jesus Christ. And, and let's just go back to the Sunday of Orthodoxy that's happening this 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 week in six days. The icons in your house, look to them for inspiration. Know that God's grace is working through those icons. As you stand before your icons and you say your prayers, know that you're not alone, that God is with us. Know that uh, the Virgin Mary is praying for you and your patron saint is praying for you and your Guardian angel is there protecting you. And we have a visual reminder of those with the icons. So all the things that we're going through now during Great Lent um, bring to the forefront our spiritual struggle, struggle our spiritual uh, grace, and will lead us to have an amazing experience of Holy Week. And the resurrection done. So I pray that uh, this pilgrimage uh, continues to bless you, and may uh, you benefit from these next forty days, uh, now thirty-nine days of Great Lent, and may uh, may our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who became one of us, uh, be with you always. God is with us. Know it. God bless you, and good evening.